Hello, everyone. Hello. Oh, my goodness, that's loud. <laughs> it's very loud. Um, welcome, everyone, and also to the online participants. I hope you have joined us again and also have perhaps had lunch or dinner wherever you are in the world, maybe even breakfast. My name's Tanya Johnston. I'm going to be moderating this session, which is all about bringing uh, science engagement activities to science festivals in a slightly more unconventional settings. So our first speaker is Tamás from Hungary, and I'm just going to give the floor to him already now. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. So I will um, really talk about how to call it call at the festival these days. So, um, so our work or job really starts at so imagine that you are at a music festival a little bit drunk going to a concert and suddenly a scientist is stepping in front of you and want to talk about science so and uh, this is our work about how to engage people who doesn't want to really talk to you but eventually will spend hours in in the tent after you can invite them in. So, but let's even step back one step for, uh, back. So, and uh, I would like to uh, uh, have the opportunity to talk about a bit of myself, how I can fit into this picture because I'm just a software engineer. So, um, my passionate about science, it's started about when I was eight years ago. And uh, I was really into geography. I was like staring for hours. My atlas started to um, learn all the countries in the world. And I was especially interested in the last pages of this that atlas, which was about the planets and the universe. So that's passionate, that uh, passionate state, but it isn't, that didn't really uh, thought about to have uh, work in a science field because we didn't have really an opportunity to to have uh, a job in in science because I'm from a little village and a little town, so there was no really um, talk about what is the science opportunities in Hungary. But long story short, I got into where I'm working right now, so I'm working in t uh, twelve years. Now at the, yeah, basically in the Central French Research Campus as a software engineer and now as a communications officer. And, um, and yeah, I think one of the key thing to have people engaged in a, in a music festival is to have, uh, to have the passion to talk about your job. And this is one of the <clears throat> keys and I will talk about the other ones. So basically I'm coming from fusion energy research field. And uh, so the basic is that we want to and try to bring down the sun to earth. And uh, this is by, uh, and uh, this is with, with fusion. So with the similar, similar way that the sun does, we would like to do it on earth as well. So this is how I, our, that's the unconventional, really unconventional way of engaging people come from, um, because we've uh, basically um, chose the fusing rabbits to engage people in the science festival. I know that it is, uh, yeah, it's really unconventional. We didn't use it anywhere else outside the festival, but there it's really efficient, I can tell you. So, and, so basically, when when uh, people at at Sigat Festival, we are at the, by the way the Sigat Festival, so which is Europe's one of the biggest music festivals, and uh, it last time when it was uh, organized before COVID, it attracts like a million people over one week. So we had a bunch of people to engage with, and um, yeah, we chose the fusing rabbits to to engage people and, um, and it works quite well there. <clears throat> so basically, uh, yeah, so when it was started, so it was our SIGET attendance started like 15 years ago 
when I wasn't even there. So this symbol is, doesn't come from me. So I, yeah, in, inherited it in some way. So when I was um, there for the first time at the Sigat Festival at 2010, I was just um, helping the daily life of the of the tent, but after that year, I was um, organizing our whole um, presence at the festival for seven years until until the COVID and until we get the chance to to get there. And now I would like to show you how a typical day of the tent uh, looks like. So basically we were located at a very crowded, like a main road of, of, the, of the island. Uh, so yeah, really, really a lot of people uh, was passing by our tent. <clears throat> so that's why we were putting there the fusing rabbits and then other engaging um, stuff to yeah, have the people attention. And after that one scientist could jump in and then invite the people into our tent, so and uh, where they can fill in questionnaires, um, talk to the scientists, and uh, of course, after filling out um, the questionnaires, they could have immediate gifts like stickers or uh, even condoms and uh, fridge magnets or uh, slash beer openers, by the way, and and the tickets for for a lottery, which uh, was. We organize every day after our tent um, closure. So our tent is basically was open from uh, 11 until 6 p.m. So this is where this is the period where the festival people are already awake, but the big concerts are not starting yet. So this is this was a, a concept and and. Uh, in, in some cases, the people could, could spend in our tent for, for like hours. And, uh, and, and the people at the, at the lottery at 6 p.m. could be in t-shirts like this, for example. And, and this is how the lottery looks like. So it's, it's worked really well. So uh, the people who came to fill in the questionnaires would, um, it was high, highly, yeah, it, it was a high chance they will come back to, to your tent at 6 p.m. for the lottery. So we have a really yeah, crowded tent at the, at the end. And uh, by the way, over the week, we, we had some like over a thousand visitors. So, so we, our tent was always full. So here are some uh, proud t-shirts owners, owners and um, yeah, this is another picture how our tent looks like. And also we, we gave uh, balloons filled with helium because the deuterium tritium fusion reaction has helium as a byproduct. So we can um, share with the people that is, un, is unharmed gas. You can, you can finally talk with it and so on. Another happy, T-shirt owner here, and um, and yeah, so people could could uh, have fun at our tent, make uh, win some T-shirts, and this is uh, really how one day at a tent look like. And also, our staff appeared at concert later as well, even at the main stage. So, and now I would like to invite you to join. Uh, join the questionnaire here so you can take your smartphone or or laptop here and go to slido.com and use that code there and i prepared for a little bit of questionnaire so i choose three uh, questions from our questionnaire to just have a feeling how how it is organized so basically we have one uh, one good answer and three totally totally wrong answer. So the first question is, what is nuclear fusion? Splitting of heavy nuclei, the mating ceremony of fusion rabbits at SIGET, union of light nuclei followed by high energy release or my plan for the night. So, and here you can 
we can see the results here. Um, so, yeah, we are waiting a few seconds more. Yeah. Okay. Answer still coming in. So, yeah, going to the next question here. So, does the fourth state of matter, the plasma, exists in nature? So, yes, for example, in lightning, the ionosphere, stars, etc. Fortunately, not at all. Yes, in the blood or on the inner wall of the tight but flexible intergalactic wormholes. Yeah, pretty good so far. Nobody is choosing the wormholes. Okay. So let's have our third question here. So where is the first reactor scale fusion experiment, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor ITER being constructed? It is Cadarache, France, Oxford, United Kingdom, South Park, USA, or planet Endor, a galaxy far, far away. Yeah, I would choose planet Endor as well, by the way. Yeah, okay, so thank you very much. So this is an insight how our question will look like. We have, by the way, 13 plus one questions. So, so yeah, so the others are also like this. So, and uh, talking about what development we made uh, during this like eight years um, since I was joining the, the team. So we've tried to develop some uh, VR experiments experience. So we've created this um, custom made Google Cardboard and, and the visitors can uh, put a smartphone in it and, and they can watch, for example, so the ether site, the construction site in, in VR, for example. So, and we've also, so I was, developed a little application, an augmented reality application, which could, could uh, project a video on an image brochure. So I think this technology still has some, <clears throat> yeah, pretty much opportunities in that. So unfortunately I didn't have the time to continue the development, but you can imagine so that um, your brochure or image brochure can came to um, live with this technology. So we've also used that to showcase some uh, videos at the festival. We also developed a uh, fusion infographics with a, with the graphics company. And uh, I must say it was done in 20, 2012. And, and I must say it's still, um, still a trendy thing. So we have it still. And, and using it all the events we, we can. So yeah, it's a really popular and uh, well-designed graphics here, which was translated into five languages so far. And uh, of course we've shared it in the fusion research community across Europe. Um, yeah, since, we are all working in a, in a research institute. I, I'm also uh, like to experiment. And, uh, and I also like to experiment with communications tools. And uh, this is what I've done for the last year when we were attending uh, SIGET. So my idea was that we've put posters in front of the, post, uh, in front of the tent. So the people who, are, who can't, just come in, just walk somewhere. They will scan the QR code and they can fill the questionnaire on, on the go. And, and uh, so they can come back later and show us the result. And they also got uh, presents and the tickets for the lottery for later today. And 
unfortunately we didn't have the opportunity to further experiment with this but at the first year when when we tried this we gain like about 10 percent more um visitors or or questioner fillers during the during the week and uh, yeah so so unfortunately as i as i said we didn't get to see get since uh, since 2018 partly because of covid partly because of the organizers for yeah for for some reason uh, really was i don't know was scared about the word nuclear so our application uh, doesn't get accepted by that by then but uh, surprisingly we got invitation for for the siget this year and uh, we applied but uh, one of our source said it's it's uh, we can apply but but we won't get in because we are pro nuclear uh, but we applied anyway and uh, our application got accepted so in a few weeks we are going to siget again and uh, for this year so we will bring there the official 3d printed um, model of the ether which was developed by us as well so we will bring there so it can be assembled disassembled on the same way like the actual machine will be so so the visitors can can play with it so it's also got really popular really we released the models like a year ago and uh, it was got printed by by dozens of individuals and also a few research institutes from the USA to Japan and so on. So and also um, we were thought about how to bring the yeah the fusion rabbits into the yeah to outside the festival. So the one of the thinking was that why not create a busy world of which are scary so so for this um, i have a colleague who have a really good um, drawing skills so i asked him to draw some rabbits which could fit the audience outside the music festival so he was uh, creating a few of those so our plan is to create a whole city filled with fusion rabbits as well um yeah and we are really hoping to be at siget this year because uh, so but it will be a surprise as well because the whole scene is changing so we will be at a really different place place uh, not where we were before so it will be really surprise for us how uh, at the new place we can <clears throat> engage the people so we are really looking forward to it. And yeah, sometimes if you have the chance to attend Siget, feel free to yeah, come and say hi at our tent. And thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm open for questions, if there's any. Thank you very much, Tamash. Any questions from the in-person audience? I have no idea how I see questions from the online audience, I'm afraid. I hope someone will tell me. I have a question. Okay. Um, you said that you engaged around a thousand people over yes. the course of a week. Does that mean you got a thousand questionnaires completed or was that a thousand, just the numbers of people that you counted in the tent? Yeah, just a thousand people came to the tent. So yeah, one of the, I think the main challenge I yeah, wanted to ask from our keynote speaker in the, in the morning that how to engage people, how to keep them engaged after, after the festival. This was um, yeah, an interesting question for us because uh, first I was just like put on the tables QR codes, which uh, uh, goes to our social media pages, but it was, absolutely zero effect. Mm -hmm. And after a few years, I just uh, put the opportunity um, on our questionnaires to, so people can, can sign up for our newsletter. And, and, uh, and surprisingly, it, it worked well. So 
basically um, half of the people gave their email address and and later after the festival we send out a newsletter like in three or four weeks and and it, and we got extremely high uh, opening rates so above average mm -hmm. so i yeah we found that way one way how to keep the people engaged after a festival so but yeah i'm open to other ideas as well yeah okay um, and if, well, if there's no other questions, I would have another question. <laughs> Anke. So how did you get the okay from your bosses to use this unconventional idea of diffusion rabbits? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so it's, uh, it somehow came before me. And, uh, and by the way, it goes through the uh, Hungarian Nuclear Society because for, for SIGET only, uh, non-profit organizations can apply. So even if we are employees of the Center for Energy Research and uh, another research institute, Nuclear Research Institute, and even the uh, Technical University of Budapest. So yeah, it somehow got through. I don't know, because yeah, they know that in a, in a festival environment, it works. So we are never using it uh, outside, of course. Um, but, but there it works ex extremely well. And just to connect there, um, so people from like visitors from the festival, do they come the next year again to your booth and say, "Hey, your diffusion rabbits can?" Yeah, is it? Yeah, like so this? so this has happened. So for example, we we had a guy, he visited our tent every year, and then I met him like six times. You know. So, but but for example, people working at Eater just bumped into our tent and say, "Oh, how awesome is that!" and how great that we were talking about theater as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, if you just switch on your microphone, make sure. Yeah, Thank I you. think it's fun. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you use the fusion rabbits mainly just inside the festival. Why don't you use them in other places? Um, yeah, it's a good, it's an, always an argument between my colleagues because somebody wants to use it outside. So, I mean, uh, yeah, in, on in like audiences, like adult audiences, or or at universities, we could use it. But uh, but outside the the festival, we also very often work with uh, children as well. So um, so that's why we we didn't really use it outside, basically because because the in most cases we didn't really um um separate like the audiences for example so that's why and did you have a question yeah i was wondering um when using the questionnaires it's it's uh like testing their knowledge do you use the questionnaires as well to see if if uh, if you can measure the impact you have since you're re-seeing them again um, is there anything to do with that? Yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, after the festival, we, we usually uh, processing the, the questionnaires and then uh, yeah, over the years they got better and better, for example. So we've we've have uh, more correct answers than than not. Of course, there are people that just put all the wrong answers everywhere so because they are yeah stupid answers but uh, <laughs> um yeah so this is the advantage for example the of the online google form questionnaire because there you immediately have the statistics so uh, that's where i yeah i really wanted to develop the things and then engage more people through the online questionnaire right. and and do you um when you <clears throat> um, take, take the questionnaires, uh, do you also ask them questions like how is your stance towards nuclear energy and how is your stance after you've talked to us? Like that, that sense of impact. Yeah, sure. We, we ask them this question and also the certain, the plus one question is, is about how is your feeling about the nuclear energy in general, for example. So um, yeah, but most of the people um, who 
got like negative um uh, negative feelings about nuclear energy when enter the tent they will uh, leave with positive feelings so that's good thank you thank you Thank you very much, Tamash. Uh, we will move on now to our next speaker, who is actually a remote speaker um, and who is up very late at night because she is based in Australia. So that's Rachel Rayner. Um, hopefully this is all going to work technically. I'm sure it will. Hi there, Rachel. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Am I coming through? Perfect. Yeah. Great. Excellent. And I'm just going to share my screen as well. So give me a second to set that up. Um, and okay. Now is that showing the presentation as opposed to the behind the scenes look? Yes, it is. Oh, great. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you for that. Sorry to call you back to the microphone. Um, hi everyone, very excited to be here. Yes, it is uh, 11 o'clock at night here. I'm in Adelaide. Um, I'm all rugged up because it's quite cold outside. I hear it's a little bit warmer for you all over there. Um, and thank you to everyone joining online as well from around the world. How exciting that we can do this. Now, uh, like Thomas's, uh, present, uh, Thomas's project about uh, music festivals, mine as well as an in-person uh, event and it is bringing science show to the world's largest arts festival. Now, this is uh, sort of a, uh, uh, well, so what is the arts festival? What is the largest art festival in the world? And I know you guys are close to Edinburgh, so I really need to asterisk this. Um, but just as a background, before we jump into it all, I'm Rachel Rayner. I perform under the title, which is not much different to my own name, which is Rachel Rayner Science Explainer. And I'm trying to use, uh, I'm trying to delve into a bit of a niche that I saw, which was a science show that was for adults, that wasn't like a dirty, naughty cabaret sort of science show, somewhere in the middle, and that wasn't a kid's show. So this I found, thought was a niche of people that just want to see um, an engaging science show. And I thought I wanted to be really wacky with it. And so I thought I'd take it to the fringe stage. So this is the poster that I had for this year. Um, I was in the gluttony tent, which is a, a space in Adelaide. And uh, something you do is if you've ever gotten a star review, you stick it all over your poster. So uh, that's what's happening there. Now, um, so what a fringe festival. So the largest art festival in the world, most of the time is in the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And this is a huge festival uh, that takes over the town in September or August, sorry, in August. Uh, but during uh, COVID lockdowns and restrictions, the largest art festival in the world happened to be the Adelaide Fringe Festival down here. Uh, so that runs in February, uh, February through to March. So it's a month long festival and it's huge. So it's not quite as big as Edinburgh on a on a good year, but it is really big. There's um, thousands of there's a thousand performers, a thousand shows, um, you know, and people come from all over the country and used to all over the world <laughs> to see it. Uh, so it is a really big stage. A fringe festival. The definition of a fringe festival is the arts that are happening around an arts festival. So you'll have a curated arts festival. And then a fringe festival is artists that just want to come in and use the spaces and the time frame around that festival and those audiences that are there for the curated program and offer them something a bit different. So it's very experimentative. Because of that, offering something different that's not curated, it is a free for all in terms of experiment and arts and creativity. So these are some photos, um, lots of circus at fringe, burlesque, cabaret, uh, and so here's some um, clips of some things. Uh, this image here on the right is um, Ruben Kay, who's one of my favorite performers. Um, very wild, very ruthless in their comment, their comment, their, <laughs> their commentary and their words, and just really out there. And I, I find them quite inspiring. 
Uh, so what I wanted to do is use this platform to just experiment and, and make something a bit different as well. So this is the Adelaide Fringe program. Every year they have a different artist to a cover and it's huge. It is a really, sorry, hang on. There we go. It is a really big program. It is so many pages long and you get this tiny, tiny little square in which you get to advertise your show. Uh, as well as being the Adelaide Fringe Program, there is the Science at the Fringe Program. So we're really lucky here. We've got the Inspiring Australia Network. That's the network that runs National Science Week or facilitates National Science Week. And then they have branches in every state. So the South Australian, uh, Inspiring South Australia, South Australian branch of Inspiring Australia, Adelaide being in South Australia, uh, does a Science at the Fringe program. And there's only a few of us that are in there, but it's growing every year. And so Inspiring Australia is really great to get on board with this festival and support it um, as they can because uh, it is such a big festival, it takes over Adelaide and Adelaide has a reputation of being called, I mean, South Australia has the reputation of being called the festival state because of the festivals that happen here. And uh, Adelaide is uh, affectionately called Radelaide because it's pretty rad some days. Uh, so from all this, this fringe energy, I wanted to create a, a show. And this actually came about not because I wanted to educate people on science because I had something to tell them. Uh, it came about because I really love the fringe atmosphere. Um, I hadn't performed on stage for a while. Um, I'll get to my background in a sec. And uh, so I just wanted to be involved in this and I just wanted to see what I could do, experiment with science communication and see could I could I do something really glittery and fabulous and just have a great time on stage with a bunch of incredible people that are there to, to see something a bit different. So I put together a show called A Flying Photon, uh, which is about the spectrum of light. And uh, I wrote it about the spectrum of light because it was my first friend show. It was my debut into this sort of field. I wanted to not necessarily start with my best show, but start with the show that's easiest to me. And talking about the electromagnetic spectrum is something I really love doing and um, have always wanted to do more and experiment in different ways. Um, I've written a few shows about light before in my time. So this was kind of bringing that all together in one big crazy ball. And the best thing about the electromagnetic spectrum is that it has a structure. And when you write a show, structure is great. This one comes with a structure. So the show is built around uh, this that we're looking at now. So going from gamma rays through X-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared microwaves, and into radio waves. So I had the science structure, and then I wrote a comedy around that. And I let the comedy grow over the months and months that I was writing it, trying to figure out what what funny elements could I bring here? What different elements could I bring in here? Because, uh, and the way I kind of told, sorry, <laughs> the way I told the story of these segments is to show the images of the center of the Milky Way so that we could see all those different photons, all these different energy photons. What do they actually look like? How do they show us different information about our universe? So these are all images of our Milky Way starting with gamma rays going through to radio waves. And of course, to tell that story, I need a lot of research infrastructure. And I calculated that in the show, I talk about 13 different uh, instruments that we use to look at light, to look at photons. Here's just uh, the six that get focused on the most. Um, I could talk about James Webb, but I don't talk about Sophia, uh, which is controversial, I'm sure, especially now, because I'm pretty certain any sort of later show I do will hold a lot of James Webb's James Webb Space Telescope images. But here I have uh, the, the telescopes that I really like to talk about. So we've got Fermi, you've got um, Rosita, um, uh, ESO, of course, um, Sophia, uh, the Murchison Widefield Array and Meerkat being the, the main ones. But there are 13 in all that I mentioned to tell this narrative, this story about light. So research, research infrastructure is really important to the structure of this show. And so the show is not just a lecture. It's really important that I use that fringe energy if I want to create a fringe show. And um, I'm someone that has a lot of different in, um, interests. I'm an avid poet. I've written a paper on science poetry with a colleague, Michael Leach. Um, I've had poems published. I'm a dancer. 
Um, and so there's all these things that I am bringing in. I'm a performer as well. Um, I do a lot of, uh, well, used to do a lot of stage um, and uh, TV presenting things. Um, so here I am bringing a little bit of physical theatre, physical comedy into the show. This is me trying to embody a wave. Uh, I'm trying to be a particular wavelength. And uh, so I do it this way, but I'm also doing it this way, trying to get that uh, wavelength, the, the big challenge in the show of trying to be a wave, trying to be a photon myself. And uh, I, it just brought in a lot of different things. So the show has, um, comedic elements. Um, I tell a lot of jokes. Um, I'm also just, uh, I think it's finding who you are as performer is very important. I'm very theatrical in my performances and I get a lot of humour through my expressions and my poses and that sort of thing. So not so much um, particular joke telling. But while we're all here, uh, what does a pirate and a photon have in common? They both travel at sea. So um, I'm sure you're all laughing hysterically. I just can't hear you. Uh, so that's um, like jokes like that that I really like that then help people remember that C is the speed of light. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, there's also just things that our science communicators are very comfortable with and that's uh, demonstrations and, and science demonstrations. So here I am showing um, how light bends through different things and how photons changing direction helps us see objects such as transparent objects. Like we're not looking at the object, we're looking at the light change direction. And what I really love with this particular demonstration that I didn't realize until I was performing it on stage under the lights is that the jug, even though when we look at the jug, it's transparent, the shadow of the jug is just as dark as me. And I just thought that was just such a fascinating discovery of how the light is moving and how our eyes are, are interacting with, are, are absorbing those photons in a different way to the objects around us. Uh, so what in my background um, came together so I could do this show? Um, so I'm from, oh, I graduated, I'm a, I'm a <laughs> sorry, I'm a science communication graduate. So I did the graduate diploma in science communication that's hosted by ANU. Um, in partnership with Questacon and at the time Shell. Um, so I did that program. Um, I was part of the Shell Questacon Science Circus, traveling around Australia doing science shows. Um, I then worked in Sydney with Questacon doing their science squad, which travel around doing in Sydney doing science shows. Um, then Smart Moves and Smart Skills, which are other Questacon programs. Uh, from there, I went to the Bendigo Discovery Science the Discovery Science and Technology Centre in Bendigo, which is a small town just outside of Melbourne in Australia. And there, Kate and I, who are pictured on the left, uh, pretty much ran that centre. And part of that was writing different science shows. And uh, I had a lot of fun. We did a lot of light shows. Um, in the second image, I'm doing one of those demonstrations from the light show, because you can change the colour of that flame depending on what special ingredients you put in the corn flour that you blow over um, a butane gas flame. And then uh, after being in Bendigo for a couple of years, I went to South Africa. I know a couple of my colleagues are in the audience, or at least in Pari around the place. I'm sorry, I can't be there. would love to see you guys again. Uh, and there I was with the South African Agency for Science and Technology Advancement, and we were finding ways to talk about science uh, in different spaces, in different centres, with different audiences, and it was all really creative. And just having these experiences helped me put this show together. Um, the Science Circus was so useful in everything I do. Really what I'm doing now with this show is just a microcosm version of what I did during that course. Um, Yes, yeah, so the show, how do you do something like this? Well, if you're gonna to go to somewhere like Adelaide or Edinburgh, I would say the first thing you do is book accommodation. Then uh, you register to be a fringe artist. So unlike other, other festivals, curated festivals, a fringe is open to anyone. And I find the Adelaide Fringe uh, organization is amazing. They are so good, they are so supportive. And how it works is you sign up with them, you pay them an admin fee, and then you tell them what you want to do. And they go, yep, great. If you need us, we're here. And uh, so then you make a very detailed budget and uh, find a venue. <laughs> so different uh, fringe 
organizations will do that differently. And then you have to do a lot of collateral, which as a communicator, it comes a lot easier than maybe um, other lines of work. So this is doing media releases, doing posters, online content, um, getting good imagery, um, and making sure your taglines are really catchy and you can get people through that door. And then of course, tell everyone. So I, I'd gone to Fringe a few times with a, uh, with a friend of mine. Um, so actually in that uh, image of the posters, there's another post there called the Wine Science Show. Uh, so that is my very good friend, Luke Morris, who is now a producer of comedy shows in Melbourne. And he was going to Fringe to on, with his show and I wanted to see what it was like. And so I just contacted him and said, can I come along and do your media and PR? And from offering that and, and hanging out with him and seeing what it was like as a performance and what he, as a performer and what he had to do, I learned a lot and I felt confident enough to go and do a show myself. Uh, yeah, so what was the reception like of this show? Well, um, so I've done it two years in a row at Adelaide Fringe, the same show. It, it definitely, you work, you know, a show is never finished. It is just abandoned. Um, so the show is improved. Well, I hope it's improved again and again and again. I'm always working on it. I'm always taking every different performance I do. I'll learn something and add or change and shift the show. Of course, the image on screen here, uh, just to reference what I'm showing, is uh, the recent Meerkat image of the center of the galaxy uh, at the heart of the Milky Way. Uh, which is really lovely. So thank you to Soraya uh, for, for sharing that image with everyone. Uh, the South African agency for, oh, you know, guys know what Soraya is, but uh, <laughs> trying to keep with good habits. So the reception was really good. The first year I did it was fantastic. Um, the way you figure out what the reception is, is you hire reviewers or you you don't hire them. You tell reviewers to come along, you give them a free ticket, you get them in the audience and then they write about your show and it helps you figure out if you're on the right track um, and how you're doing. So in the first year, um, I had uh, I sold 250 tickets. I had sold out shows and that was really good. It was something I'd done for myself and the reception I got told me that there was an appetite here and this is something people are interested in and I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> so um, I did it the second year numbers weren't as good but I had a longer season at a not great time but I still had I still saw nearly 400 people um, throughout that run which is pretty good um, so the next slide is terribly wordy and I would tell anyone not to do it but I'm doing it um, just to show you a few of the comments that I have gotten from reviewers so um, a lot of these are very positive. Um, Rachel is blazing a trail with a new type of fringe show. Um, Rachel gives us something special. She shows how science can merge with theater and poetry to offer information and entertainment at the same time. Very rarely have I had the opportunity to say, I walked away from a comedy show smarter than when I walked in, but that's the gift Raina gives you. So they're the positive ones that I collected. Um, Naomi Gall, who wrote that last quote, that, that quote that I just read, she also said that there was too much going on. She felt really overwhelmed. Um, and that was really interesting to me because something I do in my writing is I offer lots of information and I let people essentially give them like a buffet and they can choose what interests them. But then a lot of people want to absorb it all. So that that is, that is a lot. Um, Helen saw a show that didn't go great. The audience was very sleepy and very quiet and I just couldn't connect with them. It wasn't the right space. I just, yeah, it was just really difficult. Um, but she wrote some really lovely things. Uh, <laughs> didn't mean to have such a tone. She wrote really constructive things. Uh, it's really true. And I like this quote here that I've gotten, uh, which shows that maybe I'm trying too much and perhaps to stick to a few things, but it was um, what was truly impressive about Rachel was the breadth of her vision. This is a show that sought to integrate science, storytelling, comedy, poetry, and physical theater. It was not always successful, but its creative vision was breathtaking. So that's really useful to me that um, to really think about what I'm offering and is it too much for the audience? So that is some feedback that I'm getting and the other feedback being like, this was beautiful. Um, 
Naomi also wrote that the show was humorous and factual with moments of genuine wonder, which is what I'm going for. So it's there. And I think perhaps I need to cut away some of the extra stuff to get there. And that's, if you want to do something like this, that's something to think about is who is your audience? What do you want to give them? And, and, and uh, will they be giving, will they be getting, to, are you trying to give them too much really? Uh, the best feedback that I got was I won the Science at the Fringe Award, which is sponsored by Inspiring South Australia. Um, so I got a trophy and a monetary and monetary support, which helps me carry the show on and do it at other venues as well. So that was really exciting. Um, as I'm not a kids show, I didn't think I would win. Uh, the main shows, science shows at Fringe are kids shows. Um, but uh, yeah, it was really exciting to win that. So what's next? Um, Lake Macquarie, which is a town in New South Wales in Australia. They have asked for me to come up during National Science Week and perform, so I'm doing that. And Sydney Fringe is in September. The other thing that's happening is that this week, as part of PARI, uh, you can watch a recording of the show. Um, the link is there. I'm sorry it's such a numerous link. Um, and uh, we'll be sharing it on the Slack, um, and I think it'll be emailed out. Um, I mean, uh, we're going to figure out how we're going to get it to you, but we're going to get it to you. And the password is Parry SKAO uh, for this week. So it will be up just for this week. Um, so I recommend after the sessions this week, grab some friends, grab some wine, tune in, check it out, and let me know what you think. It is a longer version of what the show is now. There is more content in there. Some of that content I've harvested and I'll be taking um, to the next show because I want to write two more to make it a trilogy. Next one being about atoms and, and uh, following that electricity. So I've got all the quantum mechanics bundled up together. Um, yes, so uh, there's something else I was going to say on that. Oh yes, so the recording of the show that you are seeing, that's the one that, Na that uh, Naomi saw where she said it was humorous and factual with moments of genuine wonder. Uh, but also said there was a lot going on um, but said that she came out smarter uh, from a comedy show, which she didn't expect. So um, that was the one that was reviewed by her. Um, so you can have a look and uh, watch it with a grain of salt. So the lessons that I learned is that there is an appetite for this sort of content. People are not frightened to have a science show at an, um, at an arts festival. However, there is still a bit of a stigma. Um, I find with organisers as well, they can be a bit hesitant about supporting a science show, but it's definitely getting better. Each year is getting better. Um, and Adelaide, they're so excited about different things. Um, so different fringe festivals uh, will have different, um, different viewpoints or uh, different things that they expect. I know Sydney Fringe tried to put me in a lecture theatre last year before it was cancelled um, due to COVID. Uh, but and that's not somewhere I want to perform this show does should not be in a lecture theater it should be in a pub or it should be in an art gallery it's about taking that high science content and putting it somewhere completely different which is um, part of part of this and uh, there are lots the pathways are there to do these sorts of things there are fantastic resources around the fringe festivals the organizers are there to support artists and to get really creative content onto a stage. So um, I highly recommend uh, checking that out. Uh, so yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'll throw it over for questions. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was really interesting. Um, I would like to kick things off with a question for you. In, mm -hmm. And my question is that at the Adelaide Fringe, there's a specific science strand. How much presenting of the same shows have you done at Fringe or other festivals where there's not been a science strand? Yeah, so uh, the science strand is purely from Inspiring Australia acting outside of Fringe. Um, so that's, it's a separate industry that's come in to try and claim some of that and, and make a bit of a showcase for it, which is really nice. So it's not actually part of Fringe itself. Um, they have jumped in. Um, it's a really interesting question, actually. Sydney Fringe, I've been trying to get into, but uh, it's been cancelled for two years in a row. So it has just been Adelaide Fringe at the moment. 
taking the show on the road and taking it to places um, outside of fringe festivals, I'm still trying to figure out how it fits because the show was built for a fringe environment. Um, taking it outside that, the science content is fine. It's actually more the, the type of comedy that it is um, and the type of theatrics that it is doesn't always uh, fit. I took it to um, uh, a New South Wales regional town and one of, uh, one of the participants said, oh, I wish she hadn't tried that funny stuff and just said more science. So <laughs> okay. it's, quite a, yeah, it's quite a mix. And I think actually outside of a fringe festival, um, people get more excited about science. Uh, within a fringe festival, they get more excited about the experiment of the show. Yeah. Okay. Any questions in the room from any of our in-person attendants? Not at the moment. Oh, yeah. We do have one. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering, how do you moderate the scientific material for the audience which you're engaging with? Like that specific aspect of taking, like, where do you find that happy marriage between how scientific you're going, how comedy, like? Yeah. Yeah, great. And um, I'm someone that, as a, as a poet, I get really caught up in how beautiful science words are. Like, I love the world electromagnetic spectrum. It's such a beautiful word. So I tend to use this language that um, can be a bit much for an audience, um, for particular audiences. The way I do it is, because just knowing your content really, really well. And then um, I have a few opening jokes um, to kind of just gauge the audience. So one of them is a photon checks into a hotel, receptionist says, can I take your luggage? And photon says, no need, I'm traveling light. And then the reaction to that helps me gauge how much people know about a photon already. And so I can shift and change it then. Um, there are, and at the same time doing that buffet, that smorgasbord, there are different levels in the show. Um, so it really is that kind of a very quick assessing of the audience, which I am leaning on my background of um, the Bendigo shows, the South African shows and the um, uh, Questacon shows, the Science Circus shows to sort of use that skill so I can do it quickly. Um, but otherwise, yeah, knowing your subject matter and having those different levels that you can jump to um, is, is how, I, how I do it, yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. So we are very, very getting, better, getting very close to the end of this particular session. Um, I don't see any other questions here. I would encourage people also to use the Slack channel. If you have any further questions for Tamash or Rachel, please do put them there. And uh, yeah, I just want to take the opportunity now to thank Tamash and Rachel again for two very interesting talks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.